this yeah. We're back to the presentation, I guess. Yeah, but let me just do one more thing. Yeah, I got it. Okay, yeah, my name is Tilman V. Uh, from uh, Germany, Stuttgart, uh, southern Germany. Um, and um, I'm having the pleasure to give the first uh, lecture here. Um, and as Hussein said, it's uh, really a pleasure to see you all in person here. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, we can meet here in person. I already met a lot of uh, old friends, many of the lecturers are old friends of mine, but I'm also looking forward to make new friends with you guys. Um, that's exactly what is not happening in the week. Right? Uh, so we should take this week to discuss physics, make friends, and in this kind of situation that we are globally right now, I really think it's also a good chance to exchange our opinions about what is happening on the globe, uh, in particular in Europe at this point. We have all kinds of different backgrounds as we come together. I come from Germany, from Europe, some other stuff in Europe. We have people from the US, but we will also have some people with a Russian background here. And um, I think it's a good opportunity to just discuss these things and maybe come up with a view of scientists on the situation, let's say. Because what we are facing right now, I think, is really dangerous for all of us. Of course, more for us in Europe, maybe not so much for you guys here at this point, but eventually, if there's a nuclear catastrophe, then the whole globe is affected. Um, so, I'm really concerned, as you can see, I came by train. I was traveling more than 24 hours to get here. In Europe, you can't use the train anymore as you travel via Russia. For example, if you take a train to China, usually you fly via Russia. Right? That's no longer possible. You cannot travel to Russia, or you cannot enter the airspace to Russia. But what's more, people are dying there. Right? So, uh, and yeah, as you see, I'm, I'm a little bit emotional. Um, so we have one week of time, and besides physics, I thought we can at least spend a little bit of time discussing this in the evening and so on. Find out about uh, of each other's view on that situation. I mean, last night we already started uh, to discuss these things, and I think it's important that scientists have an opinion. Because in previous times, you know, in times of the Cold War, it were the scientists that kept the ties alive between people in Russia and Europe and the US. There was a scientific exchange between a very good scientist in Russia, in Europe, and the US, despite the wall and the Iron Curtain. And that was very valuable um, for surviving that dark period, and it will be very valuable in the coming, hopefully not so dark, but maybe dark. So I think as scientists, we have a responsibility to discuss these things and keep our ties up, even across uh, these borders. Okay, that's uh, what I wanted to say about this. Um, Hussein also asked me to uh, spend a few minutes on the development of the field uh, with physics in general. And you see that one of the sponsors of this here is this so called GYRIC project, which is a national priority program in Germany funded by the German Science Foundation. And the history to that is uh, that in 2014, we had a ITEM workshop here at the Biosphere. Organized by Hussein, I guess that was 1.0 yeah. uh, uh, Winter School. I'm not sure whether there was one before. Okay, no, this thing is not working. This is working. Hussein, you really messed up my setup. So let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, and when I came here in 2014 in the plane, I just downloaded and printed a paper 
on Rydberg excitation in cupress oxide. You will hear about this uh, uh, by Valenti uh, during that week. That was brand new news at the time that all the Rydberg physics that we are discussing in the atomic world, the atomic physics world, eventually has uh, maybe an application in semiconductor physics. You know, cupress oxide is a semiconductor. So it's a piece of crystal, and you can maybe think about devices that you make from, uh, from that material. Yeah? So I was totally fascinated, and it became, uh, I spent the first 20 minutes back then, not on my own research, but on that work on the cupress oxide. Um, and it became clear then that the Wittberg physics as such is not only AMO physics, it was also becoming solid state physics. And uh, on the way back, uh, or in the coming months, basically, I sat down and initiated a national priority program. You know, in Germany, you have to write a proposal for that. Uh, so I did that. And that's one of the figures, basically, that, uh, that I used there. And there you see what I thought back then in 2014 was um, were the hot topics in the field. OK, you see um, this ranges from sensors to Rydberg atoms in ion traps, quantum simulation, interaction engineering, Rydberg physics and semiconductors. Yes, that's the stuff that I was just mentioning. Quantum optics, single photon devices, and polaritons. Molecules, you know, these ultra long range molecules, you will hear about that during that week as well. Purity physics, clusters, impurities, and then hybrids between Rydberg atoms and other systems, let's say optomechanical structures, uh, fibers, uh, and even superconducting cubes. Okay. And all of that is based on the strong interactions of Rydberg atoms. So this program uh, was named Giant Interactions in Rydberg Systems, and in short, GIRI. Okay. Uh, and it is based on the achievements, of course, of the AMO community, laser cooling, both the Einstein condensation and also quantum information processing. As well as uh, you know the cavity QED achievements that people have done before, and, and also uh, Rydberg spectroscopy, let's say the single body physics of uh, of a Rydberg atom in, in in fields. Now, if you look at this <laughs> from today's perspective, you see that one thing is missing here, and um, that has uh, governed the field now for the last uh, few years. And that is quantum computing. I mean, we knew that we would be able to do quantum simulations, but digital quantum computing was not on my map in 2014. But of course, you all know uh, that uh, this has changed now. Yes, um, the Rydberg platform is is a very powerful platform as compared to the other quantum computing platforms, um, as it can provide a large number of Qubits up to 300, I believe, or it's the current status. Um, the Rydberg interaction provides a qubit, two qubit uh, gates. Um, and what's more, it's a two dimensional arrangement that is dynamic of the qubit. So the connectivity can be a dynamic, dynamical one, which has huge implications for the algorithms that you are going to run on the quantum computer. Yes? Other platforms like the superconducting platform have a fixed circuit and the connectivity is sort of fixed. Yes. You cannot arrange, rearrange it while you are doing the, the computation. But that's what is in principle possible in the Rydberg platform. And it's even not restricted to 2D. Yes, you know these uh, beautiful pictures from the Paris group here, Antoine Bovet's group, now where they place the qubits in the shape of an Eiffel Tower. Yes. So in three dimensions. So no platform can have a three-dimensional architecture other than the Rydberg platform. And what, why was it not so uh, apparent in 2014? Well, that is, has to do with the fidelities. Yes, of course, at that time, the first demonstrations of two qubit gates based on Rydberg atoms had already been demonstrated, again, by Antoine Ove and uh, Mark Zeffman's group. But you, if you look at the fidelity, so that's the infidelity that I'm so, uh, sorry, that's the, yeah, that's the infidelity that I'm uh, plotting here, one minus the fidelity. Uh, this gate of 
operations at the time were not competitive with the other platforms. And, uh, and that has changed over the last years. And that's what this graph is meant to say. So this is the year here. This is the infidelity, one minus the two qubit gate infidelity, uh, one minus the infidelity over the years. And you see that other competing platforms in quantum computing, trap ions, superconductors, they have uh, right handed persons. And it's pointing to the left hand. So this is the ion trapping platform for quantum computing. It came down first with the uh, infidelity, so fidelity is uh, below, infidelity is below 1%. Then the superconducting platform, that's where IBM and Google are working, that also came, came down a little bit later. And now in the Ritberg platform, we experienced over the last few years that the, the infidelities are also on that level, 1% and less. That's a major achievement, yes, and it will influence our field dramatically. Um, because there's big money involved, that's the reason. Yeah? So you can see that uh, already here, there are startups, companies worldwide that have formed to commercialize this platform. Uh, this one is the one in Paris, so what is the answer here, around Antoine. Over you also see other aspects. Actually, if you go to the website, you can't read it really, but they tell it, they call him the quantum guru. Yes. Um, then, of course, atom computing. I mean, most of you are from the uh, our MIT area. So you know this company here, with the Misha, who will be here. I think later you read Lada and Markus and so on. It's an impressive uh, uh, company as well. And there's another one in, uh, in Berkeley called atom computing that is also commercializing this platform with quantum atoms. And there's another activity at Cold Quanta in Boulder. So four companies uh, have uh, raised a lot of funding, tens of millions of euros, to uh, make this platform a competitive one with respect to the others. And of course, uh, this is, these are huge opportunities for everybody who can just barely start the world with, right? Let's say <laughs> can be hired by those companies. Yeah? Um, and uh, uh, and that's a development that's just in the US and, and, and one company in, in, in Europe here uh, has also triggered a lot of uh, stuff in Germany, um, including in our group. Uh, these are actually our Rootberg teams. We have so far only been working on uh, um, basic research questions, and I will only report on these if, on very basic questions without any potential application, right? just curiosity driven uh, research with Ritberg atoms. But very recently, again, as a consequence of the pandemic, the German government has set up a huge program for research in the quantum area. They are going to spend 2 billion euros for quantum technology in Germany. Okay, and uh, so we thought, okay, what can we do? <laughs> uh, so what we can do is uh, set up a quantum computer, this is a quantum computer. And this is one of, uh, this is our project. Um, you see, we have even, all that's all we have. We have a website and a <laughs> For invest. We don't have anything else yet. And we're just starting. But I'm still advertising it here because we are, of course, hiring people. Yeah? Um, and if you wonder what this is, our logo here, yes, this is the state of Baden Württemberg, and you see a Wittberg electron orbiting the state. And um, yeah, we are working on this or in, in the lab and uh, in theory. And the first thing that is coming up soon is a Emulator, yes. So if your experiment is not working yet, you can still emulate it, yes. And so if you sign up on this website, you will get informed by April, so in a few weeks from now, and you can play with the quantum computer. You will not recognize that it's not really an experiment yet, it's just an emulator, so the number of qubits is restricted, but it's going to be fun, yeah, to play with it. Um, and the name actually comes from 
where we are, yes, we are in Swabia. Schwäbisch, yes, has the A with an umlaut, A, it has these two dots, yes. And so we tend to, anything that has an A, yes, like man, we tend to put two dots on top of the A, yes. So that's why this web page is called the quantum land, with these two dots here. But as the American keyboard doesn't have it, it has an A down here on the lower left, A E S N E. Yes. That's actually the, 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 the campaign of our state government that we are adopting. Anyway, so that's enough of the advertising. Let's come to the business. What's the time now? It's already half past nine. That's right. <laughs> Huh? You will not be surprised in that time. Let's see how far we get. Okay, you, you just interrupt me at some point. Okay. Um, good. So, the topic of my talk today, of my lecture today, um, is cold ions in a dense environment and rhythmic atoms in a dense environment. So, what is a dense gas? Think about the Bose Einstein transfer. Yes. The mean particle distance there is a few hundred nanometers, and the Rydberg atom can be much larger than this. Okay, so what happens? Or you place a single ion in there and you ask the question I apply an electric field, and then the ion starts to move, but the neutral atoms don't see that the electric field is just stay around. And then this ion starts, wants to move, but it scatters quickly with the ground state atoms. Okay. And then you ask, okay, that's the situation that I really know from solid state physics. Um, if there's a lot of scattering going on, then there's a Drude model. Yes, there, there the electrons, despite the fact that you are applying a constant force, only have a, a, a constant velocity. They are not accelerated okay, because they are constantly scattering. So this kind of question, you know, what is the ohmic resistance of a Bose Einstein condensate is what is describing this research here. Yeah. So think about the PPC here, you put some electrodes, yes, you apply electric field, and you ask yourself, how is a charge going to be transported through that dense uh, medium? Okay, that's gonna be uh, the first part here. First with ground state atoms, they have a small polarizability. Yeah, so ions are going to scatter from ground state atoms that have a small polarizability. But then we will also let these ions interact with Rydberg atoms, and they have a huge polarizability. Okay. Um, and we discovered recently a new uh, molecular bond of a molecular ion where one Rydberg atom is bound to a ion, a cold ion. And I'm going to describe that molecular bond to you at the end of that lecture. So let's start with the basic interaction, classical physics between an ion and an atom, a neutral atom that is polarizable. Okay. What kind of potential do you expect you know, on the keyboard level? Well, the potential that you expect is due to the charge that this ion has. And the charge has, is producing an electrical field. That electrical field forms off with one over the distance squared. And that electric field is going to induce a dipole moment in the neutral atom. That dipole moment itself is proportional to that electric field. And then this dipole moment is interacting with the electric field so that the potential falls off with one over the distance to the force power. So there is a potential here, C4 over R to the fourth power. Forget about the green vector. Yeah. Uh, just the scaling is important. Um, that uh, the two-body physics is uh, governed, uh, governed by at large distances. And of course, at very short distances, then there's some repulsive force. Okay. Now, if you take a particle, this is all classical physics now, yes. Um, and you let it scatter from a charge here, that's my ion, yes. Um, then this uh, polarizability is such 
that the dipole moment you know that is induced will let this round state atom be attracted by the time. And that leads to trajectories that are either scattered in a glancing collision and will be deflected by a little bit if the distance is large to the ion, or if the distance to the ions or the impact parameter is smaller than the critical one we see here, then these trajectories will spiral in in that potential. It's many, many turns around the ion until it eventually hits this inner repulsive barrier, then it spirals back out again. Yes, and if this is an elastic collision, then this particle that comes out essentially has a random direction. Yes, the scattering angle um, below that impact parameter DC is random. Yes. And if you now calculate the uh, scattering rate, you first uh, have to calculate the cross section. That's basically just the area defined by that VC here. And the VC itself is, is easy to, uh, to calculate. It is just connected. If you, if you, if you just um, um, take the relative collisional energy, of, of the collisional energy of the relative motion, that's this E call here. Yes. And you equalize it to this potential energy that defines the DC. Therefore, you can calculate that cross section by just the square root of that C4 coefficient, which is nothing else than the polarizability up to some factors, um, divided by the collisional energy. Um, and that's to the fourth uh, root. Yes, maybe I should write this down here. More. So if I have a C4 potential divided by my um, DC to the force potential uh, to the force power, and I say this is equal to the collisional energy, the relative kinetic energy, and I resolve this for DC, then I get um, the um, C4. Uh, divided by the collisional energy or root up to some factor. Okay. And if I square that, so that means my sigma is proportional to the root, the second root of C4 divided by C4. Okay. That's what is written here. And now, if I calculate, that's an interesting thing. That is the property of this one over R four potential, the scattering rate. And I take this cross section, multiply it with the density n and the relative velocity v. So this relative velocity is also proportional to the square root of the uh, collisional energy. So the energy dependence drops out. The collision rate between atoms, round state atoms, and an ion is independent of the energy, the, 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 the velocity uh, or the energy between the particles. Yes. That's interesting, right? So no matter what the, how fast you hit the, the ion with your round state atom, the collisional rate will be constant. Okay. Good. So um, now let's come to our situation. We have a Bose Einstein condensate or a dense gas. Yeah. Um, we place an ion in the center. How we do this, I tell you later. And we apply an electric field. Yes, we have an electrode here and here. We just apply an electric field and drag the ion along the BEC. And what is going to happen is that this ion is accelerated hits a ground state atom with this kind of collision here. And after this collision, its direction is randomized yes? in the center of mass frame of that collision. Okay. Now you can simulate it. Okay. Uh, you can just do a classical trajectory simulation. And uh, here I'm putting some realistic numbers now for you. This is the time scale. 
This is uh, in microseconds, 5, 10, 15 microseconds. That's going to be the time scale of the experiment. And these are the velocities here um, that we measure in the, of the trajectory. Okay. Um, and these are the fields that we apply millivolts per centimeter. So you see, your experiment has to have a very good electric field control. Already, if you exceed a few millivolts per centimeter, the forces on that iron are so strong that it will immediately kick out of the BEC. So, but if you have small enough fields, like one millivolt per centimeter, like this lower one here, first you will see a little bit of ballistic motion, the, the iron will accelerate. And then it will hit a steady state velocity, just like in the Bruno model, yes, where you have this constant velocity um, of drifting ions, basically, yes, it's drifting from collision to collision. Okay, and you see that this um, velocity here, which is the current, the ion current, it's multiplied by the charge, that's just the current, that's the ion current, is just proportional to the electric field, yes, that's the Ohm's law. Only okay. Here you see a little bit more detail of these uh, numerical simulations. Um, here you see maybe maybe you concentrate on this one up here. That's just the distance from the starting position. You see the the blue points are uh, the collisional events in the in the numerical simulation, and in between there's always an accelerated motion. You know where, of course, if you have a constant acceleration, the velocity. Uh, uh, increases with time, but then it's colliding again and starts from scratch. And if you look at this from the distance, you see it's actually a straight line. Right? If there would be just no collisions and it would be ballistic, it would follow this parabola. Right? Okay. Um, yes. So let's. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit here. I think I'm way behind. Uh, Schedule. Let's see how we can do uh, the experiment now. Yes. How are we creating a cold ion in this PEC? And only a single one. Yes. This is important now because if there's a second ion, the forces between two ions are so strong that you know, the whole thing just explodes. So we have to make sure we find a way to generate a single ion and it has to be cold. Now, there are many ways you can uh, generate a single ion in the PEC, and uh, many people are, for example, building a power trap around the PEC and trapping an ion in a power trap and overlap it with the PEC. This, uh, of course, also delivers interesting results, but one of the problems there is that in a power trap, the ion is always jiggling around. Yes, the power trap is an RF trap. So the iron never stands still and has a relatively high temperature. It's very hard to make very cold ions. And we want to have an iron that is microcaldic cold. Yeah? So the way we do this is not use the power trap, we just do a Wittberg excitation. Yes? First, and you know this blockade physics excludes any second Wittberg atom in a certain radius. If you make this radius larger than the PEC, which is easily possible, then you have just a single Wittberg atom in your PEC. That's this uh, uh, excitation here, two, two color excitation to some Wittberg state, NS here. And now you have to ionize it, yes? But you have to ionize it in a very gentle way. You don't want to kick it out. So for example, if you do it by field ionization, you already apply 100 volts, yeah, then it's gone, yes? You have to Feel this 100 with one millivolt per centimeter, yes, a very small heat. So, one way we have various ways, but one way we are doing this is by an inverted Raman transition. So, we go from that S, Rydberg S state, up to the continuum with two, two lasers. Yes, they are just diffused a little bit. So, if you have heard about Raman transitions, they usually take the ground state and then via some transition from one ground state level to another one. But you can just as well do it the other way around. Have a long lived uh, lift back state, go to the intermediate, uh, short lived, uh, let's say, P state here, and go to the continuum. Okay. That's how we make this single line. Yes. And then we drag it along. Um, yeah, so that's the generation. Um, 
we um, have an excess energy of that ion that is less than uh, 10 microfarads. So this way we have, uh, if you use a focused laser inside the PPC, localize that ion pretty well to let's say one micrometer or so, and we make sure it's a single one. And we just locate, and then we just apply an electric field, one millivolt, drag it over and measure the displacement. Yes, how far did it get? Now, oh, this is and this is our apparatus. Just to give you an impression, this is how it looks like. If you're interested, uh, talk to me and we can talk about experimental details. After all, this is experimental physics. Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of uh, details that are very interesting. One of them is the the cage we call that. Yes, that's our cage. Yes, if you want to control the electric fields down to the millivolt level, you have to have electrodes in all three directions to compensate any stray field that you get from windows or surfaces. Um, and that's our cage. Yes, so all of these plates are connected to the outside world, and we can control the voltage. Yes. Um, and what is also inside here is a lens, so that is actually allowing us to focus that beam to one micrometer to localize the ion. And in the back here, there's a multi channel plate. That is a device that can just detect ions with a very high, in this case, only temporal resolution. So this is a sort of a schematic drawing. This on the right side, this is the cage. In the cage, we have the PPC. Uh, this is the long axis. We apply the electric field in this y direction. And then if we are extracting the ions to the MCP by just applying an, a, a large voltage on these blue electrodes, uh, we are sucking them out of the PEC. Then their time of flight to this MCP detector depends on the y position. That's something you can simulate with Simeon, but you have to believe me. Uh, the travel time of that ion that is down here is actually longer than the one that is in the center here. Yes. So if you now measure the arrival time of this at this MCP here in microseconds here, you you see that um, the uh, this is the time of acceleration in the PEC or in the thermal cloud, um, and you see that in the thermal cloud the atoms move further out than uh, in the PEC, where they basically are more stuck, let's say. Yes. Now, converting this kind of raw data into real space data is a little bit involved. Uh, I don't go into the details. Um, if you want, uh, just uh, uh, talk to me. As a function of the evolution time from that kind of data, we can extract the position along this y direction. For different fields. Um, and from that, you can then calculate this drift velocity, yes, this average drift velocity. You see, if you go back, the position just linearly depends more or less in the beginning at least on this evolution time. Yes. So we just take a slope here, determine the velocity and plot it here as a function of the electric field. So that's the omic behavior, basically. Yeah? Um, and if you compare it to our model, which is this model that I described to you, it, it's, it's okay-ish, yes. Um, but in the experiment, there's something else going on than what we have simulated. The mobility or this velocity is actually always a little bit larger than you would predict from that elastic collision model. And of course, what is going on is there are also inelastic. Uh, that we have not included in the, in the model. And uh, that's uh, uh, something we can also do. I won't uh, describe it today. That describes essentially that uh, discrepancy between the experimental model, uh, between the theoretical model and the experiment. But in a nutshell, we can measure with this technique the mobility of that charge in this dense uh, environment. Okay. Now, we have this complicated procedure to extract the position from the time of flight. As an experimentalist, they always say, I really want to see it. I want to see it with my bare eyes right now in real space. Yeah? So the way to go experimentally is to build a microscope, a spatially resolving microscope, not only 
an MCP that detects the time of flight. But there are detectors that can as well record the XY position in addition to the time of flight. So this is the experiment that I just described to you. This is a more recent version of experimental data now that is using our eye microscope that we have built. And so what you see here is a cloud of atoms. That is this ellipse. We are starting the ions here at this red focal spot of that focal laser. And we are dragging them with 1.5 millivolts per centimeter to the right. And now every blue dot here is an, uh, is an ion detected in real space in three dimensions. Um, as it is moving through, uh, in this case, actually a thermal cloud. So there are not a lot of collisions going on. You see most of the atoms actually make their way ballistically, but then there are some that are scattered and they give rise to this scattering halo uh, that you can see down here in a projection um, as well. Okay. So that's what you can do if you have an ion microscope. Now, how does this ion microscope work? Okay, so maybe I should also jump across this. Um, yeah, uh, microscopy is of course an old field, and there are lots of things to be discovered. Yes, if you, if you have a microscope, this is just one example. Yes, uh, how much uh, you gain if you have that uh, ability in the lab to um, to look at things directly in real space. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you look at the length scale of things that might be interesting, you see these Rydberg molecules or these ions that we are talking about. We, we just need a resolution in the micrometer range. Yeah, that is actually easy easy for an ion microscope. Yeah. Our ion microscope can resolve stuff down to 200 nanometer. So it's, it's it's too good for this section. Yeah. Um, but there are other things that are interesting in that range as well, and that's what we are going to do with this ion microscope in the future. For example, if you put a Fermi gas, yeah, the Fermi length is on that order of a few hundred nanometers and you can look at correlations yes if you can detect single uh, atoms or ions um, that are due to the fermionic nature of a gas that you put under this microscope or other things like polaron physics vortices rotons you name it uh, that are um, happening on that interesting scale of a few hundred nanometers so how does it look like well that's the apparatus you see, this is a standard Siemens lower medium uh, uh, setup. It's a science chamber where, um, where the interesting stuff happens. And that's this column here. Yes. This is our ion microscope. It has this MCP detector at the top. And that detector now can not only resolve the time of flight, like the previous one, but it can also resolve XY positions. Now, the resolution of that, the position resolution of that uh, uh, channel plate is on the order of 50 to 100 micrometers. That's not good enough for us. Yes, we need to be better. So, we need an optics in between that provides us with a magnification of anything we want to look at of a factor of roughly 1000. Because then we have a resolution of 50 to 100 nanometers. Yeah, that's where we want to get that. And that's where all this stuff in between is uh, used for us. Yes. We have three lenses, electrostatic lenses in between, actually lens one, two, and three, that we can put on some voltages such that we focus the ion trajectory. And now with any optic setup, yes, if you have lenses available, you can produce a magnification. Yes. Um, and these lenses are tunable. Yes, you just change your voltages and you change their focal lengths. So you can you can change this magnification if you want. Um, okay, so we are making our code atoms somewhere here again in a cage or tin can, let's say, yes, because we need to control the electric field very well. So that is actually sitting all in here down here. And you see it's a complicated mechanical setup, but it's all self-made, huh? so we are quite proud of this. Um, uh, and then there's another lens section here and here. Now, the important thing about this is, 
it's a pulse microscope. Yeah? We, we need we need zero field when we do our physics. And then at some given time, we can switch on the expression field and map the ions onto our spectra. That's a big difference to the commercial ion microscope, yeah, which usually has it, it's a CW mode, it's not a pulse. Yeah. So that's very important for us. So why is it important? Because of this, yeah, look at this movie. You have some object of interest, you want to observe it, and then snap at a certain time when you are interested in it, you switch on your voltage and you extract the ion from the region of interest. Okay. So this is how it looks schematically. We have something that is happening down here in our science chamber. And uh, at time equals uh, T1, for example, we start our Wittberg excitation or our sequence. Then we can let it evolve, for example, transport the ion along, yes, for some evolution time in a very controlled, very small field. And then at PC, P2, we extract everything by just applying a large voltage on the screen electrodes. That's the chameleon sucking out the uh, ion to the um, lens system. And then at some later time, P3, the ions are arriving there. And that time difference between two and three is the time of life that carries all the information about the third direction. Yeah. So with this device, we can determine the three dimensional distribution of ions in a certain volume. Um, actually, then I showed this uh, slide for the first time. Martin Lebenstein was in the audience, and he liked this picture the most, where the chameleon is digesting the data. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's very important. Yeah? Not only taking data, but you also have to digest it. Yeah? Uh, okay, so what's the specs? Spatial resolution is below 200 nanometers, time resolution below 100 nanoseconds. And we have an extremely large depth of field. Now, I know some of you are working on foreign gas microscopes, optical fluorescence foreign gas microscopes. You can also detect the fluorescence. Very nice and beautiful experiment, of course. But typically, what is missing there is the depth of field right, in the first dimension. That's, that's one of the advantages. This thing also has disadvantages, of course. Uh, but one of the big advantages is also the very high time resolution. And that's made for this purpose. Now, if you look at the um, uh, start map in the uh, in the for the back phase, yes, that's how the energy levels behave in a in an electric field. Then you see that with back atoms are also polarized, just like the ground state atoms. Yes, in first order, at least, if you stay with low L states like the S state here. The dependence on the electric field of the energy levels is quadratic. Yes. So that is described by polarizability, the size of which gives you um, the size of the diaper moment for a certain electric field. Yes. But you see that uh, the, the whole plot here is, a, is much more interesting, let's say, or you could say more messy. Yes. Because there are all these high L states around here yes, that have a linear star state. Because the, uh, if, if L is larger than, let's say, 3, then effectively all the higher L states are all degenerate. And the diaper moment is there from the very beginning. You don't need to induce it. Yes? And therefore, there is a linear start effect for those states. And that gives rise to these bands of uh, star states here as well. So if the electric field gets stronger, Eventually, interesting uh, situations can appear, for example, these kind of crossings. Yeah. Now, what can we do with this microscope? For example, we can just detect the uh, ion and excite a Rydberg atom around it in the surrounding. Yes, that's an electric field that induces a shift of the energy levels. And if I now tune my laser, for example, here, 3 megahertz, 6 megahertz, 9 or 15 megahertz away from the free resonance. Then I'm going to facilitate the excitation in the shell around the eye. 
project. And we can resolve spatially how the shell looks like. Yeah, this is experimental data now. Yes? So they are looking like a circle around the eye. Yeah? And you can measure that distance and compare it to this uh, uh, potential, this one over R4 potential. That's a yellow line here, and this uh, colored background here is the experimental data. And you sure enough find yes, that your dark map calculation was correct, and you got the um, um, correct distances. In this case, the distance actually from the, between the ion and the um, Whitbeck atom is on the order of 20 micrometers. These are very high line states now, yes, 129 S states. So we can just directly map out these potential curves with this microscope. Uh, you can also let some dynamics happen. Yes, you excite it and then you just wait before you extract. And then you see that this, there's something going on. Yes, the Whitbeck atoms are attracted by the line. They fall into the potential and something happens. What exactly happens? You still have to digest together with Peter's group, actually. We're trying to find out what exactly happens there. Uh, but we have the data, <laughs> we can look at it. Um, and it's interesting. Yes, there's some uh, state changes going on and so on in this potential. But uh, finally, I want to show you our two molecules. I still have 15 minutes or something. Yeah, we do. Uh, and that is uh, something that happens at these interesting points here. Yes. Where, for example, for the P state, the start map goes down. It's a quadratic uh, start effect because of the polarizability, yes. And then they cross here with the hydrogen like linear start map curves. And there seems to be a field where, if you imagine an avoided crossing around here, there should be a, 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 a found state, right, at a certain distance. I mean, we have seen that if we are exciting the atoms um, somewhere here, yes, in the, in the previous experiment, they will be sucked in by the forces uh, of the ever increasing electric field as you come closer to the ion. But on this curve, it looks different. Yes, you will be sucked in, but then if you are making a transition to this line, you will be repelled again. So there is a minimum in the energy landscape. And that calls for a bound state. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's focus on this a little bit. Yes, now I have converted that uh, start map into a map where I plot the distance. Yeah, I, I can just convert the electric field at the distance from the ion into a distance here and map out the energy levels as a function of the distance of the ion. Yeah. So, then you see the same crossing that I showed you in this red circle here. And you see that for large distances, there's an attractive force. For short distances, there's a repulsive force. Yes? So what is going on? Let's try to have a look. Um, well, if you zoom in, yeah, now you have to zoom in and look at the fine details of these potentials. So now what we are doing is we are zooming in here. We are zooming in here. And we are again zooming in here. Yeah? Then you see that indeed, this is not a crossing, it's an avoided crossing. And there's a splitting here. Yeah? The splitting is on the order of 100 megahertz. Yeah? That's, that's a big splitting. Yeah? Um, and around that minimum here, which is this minimum here, you can do just a harmonic oscillator calculation and calculate the vibrational state. If you do that, you find that this vibrational state here has a width that is much smaller than the width size. So it means it's not enough just to calculate the start map to get the real potential. Yes, because not a point particle that is experiencing this field of the ion, it's an extended object with a charge distribution. And so what you want to do then is to do a multifold expansion and calculate these potentials in a multiple expansion, and that was not done by us, that was done by uh, the group of uh, Georg Reitel and also by Johannes Hecker Benschlag. They proposed this molecule um, and they, 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 they um, 
conducted this calculation with the multiple expansion. So you not only take the dipole moment, but the quadrupole moment, the octopole moment, and so on into account. And then you get this, the real potential here. Yeah. It turns out if you go to L equals six or so, this is converting. That's enough. Yes. And then you have the potential energy surface. You can quantize it. You can predict what the vibration the level spacing is. And for this particular case, um, it's 11 megahertz. Yeah, that's a 54 p, I suppose. And around this, we would expect a vibrational splitting of uh, 11 megahertz. That's nice. Yeah, that's something we can recall with our microscope. Here. So uh, to summarize this, on we have this potential curve here that looks like a harmonic oscillator in first uh, approximation. And it's interesting to understand a little bit what the binding mechanism really is here. Yes? Because on the right side, you are attracted to the ion. That means if you look at the Rydberg state, and that's a, a, a cut through the uh, electron orbital, the dipole moment, the charge of the electron is on this side. Yes? So the, the, the um, negative uh, charge is on the left side. If you go to this position, you are in these high L uh, states, the hydrogen like states, which go up in energy. So the electron sits on the other side. So that means if, you, if your uh, molecule is now vibrating, the dipole moment is flipping while it's going through that uh, minimum here. Yes? So that's why we call it the flipping dipole interaction or something. Yes? So with 11 megahertz, the electron changes its. Uh, center of mass from being on the left side, so towards the ion, to the right side, so on the opposite side of the original ion that is sitting here at zero. Okay. Good. So how does it look like? Ah, okay. And it's a bond type uh, that is uh, not in your chemistry book. Yeah? It's neither covalent nor ionic or van der Waals, and it's also not a trilobite. Yeah? You will hear a lot about trying to I'm sure, during that uh, week. But it's a pretty bad for molecule, let's say, yeah? uh, It's a molecular ion. So do, how do we do the experiment? Well, we create an ion. We have uh, learned how to do that. We excite a Rydberg atom with the right uh, laser frequency, such as to hit, for example, one of these vibrational states. Then we have a bound object between the ion and the Rydberg atom. Then we want to separate the two, such that we can tell on the detector who is who. Yes, where, who is the ion and who is the Rydberg uh, atom. If we would just pass on our microscope in a single step, we would just rip everything apart, and we would not be able to tell the difference. Yes. So we have a small intermediate step where we first pull the ion and not feel ionize the Rydberg atom, which is neutral. Which is not as much affected by that very small field, such that the ion has a head start towards the detector. Yes. And then we field ionize the Rydberg atom. That's the conundrum here. And then we look at the detector in space and time. In time, we have separated the signal from the ion and the Rydberg atom by that intermediate small pulse. Yes. Um, so if you look at the detector just in time of light, you see these two peaks here, yes, and you can clearly assign who is who, yes. Um, one is the ion, and the other one is the Rydberg. Yes? So if we then look at the spatial information, yes, on our detector, we have, for example, an ion click here and the Rydberg click here, uh, then we can measure the distance between the two, yes. Um, and we can plot everything, for example, centered around the ion. That's how we usually uh, plot the data. Then. So, and if we have uh, events on the detector, like a series of events like this, and we only take the ones with two events. I mean, and two events, one from here and one from here. So the chameleon takes this one, this one doesn't like this, yes, so, and this one is also taken. Yes. So then if we do that, and we plot as a function of the laser frequency, uh, the signal, how many such objects we get, we see a nice vibrational splitting. 
a non vibrational spectrum basically with the predicted uh, vibrational frequency up to the vibrational level of 10 or so. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there is actually another potential curve down here, which serves us as a reference. Where we also see a bound state at this guy. Okay, so we know the spectroscopy. Um, we can do now under the microscope interesting stuff. We can just produce those molecules at some starting position and again do a transport measure. Yeah? We can just apply an electric field. Now, if you have an, a Rydberg atom only, uh, sorry, an ion only without Rydberg atom, it has one medium mass. Yeah? But the molecules have twice the mass if it's bound. Yeah? So if I have an electric field, the molecular ions will just travel half the distance because they have twice the mass. So what we do essentially is mass spectroscopy, yeah? just by looking at it with this microscope. So you see that if we drag the initial ions along and we don't do the Rydberg excitation, they travel from here to here, 25 microns. And if we do the, if we sort of take the ion and uh, connect it to a Rydberg atom, we make it twice as heavy, then you just travel half the distance. And so this is a, a quantitative way to convince yourself, yes, these objects are really bound, even if you drag on them. Yeah. But you also see a little bit of uh, interesting stuff. I mean, if you look at this blue curve, some of these ions on the way, on the, of these molecular ions on the way start to decay and so on. So we have to also look at the lifetime. Here's the lifetime. It's about two or three microseconds. Yes. These molecules are not very long lived. Um, and uh, there are the tests now. If, you, if you're interested, you can ask questions about that, of course. Um, but then if you use the microscope again, uh, we can look at the shape of this molecule. And what we expected initially was, uh, that should be just a round object. Yes? It should be fully isotropic. Yes, the electric field of the ion is fully isotropic. So why should there be any structure? But then we, we looked at it in the experiment these are the, how the molecules look like as yes, plot the position of the Rydbergs relative to the ion in the center. You see that there is a preferred direction. This molecule has what is called an alignment a certain, along a certain direction. So what is going on? Well, we only figured it out after we did the experiment. So it's, it's useful to have a microscope in the lab to you know, get such questions posed by nature to you. And uh, the, what is happening here is that we are doing a two photon excitation. And these excitation lasers have a polarization. And in the electric field, the selection rules uh, depend on the direction of that electric field. So in certain directions, the matrix element is uh, reduced. And in other directions, the matrix element is enhanced. And that can be, of course, theoretically calculated and compared with the experiment, and that nicely explains it. Uh, and you can probe it if you, for example, rotate this polarization from here to here, when the picture changes as you expected. Uh, uh, from here. And you can measure the bond lengths, which is about four uh, micrometers in this way. In this, uh, okay, so that uh, summarizes, uh, I think, the final part of my. Uh, first lecture, I showed you that we have that high resolution single ion imaging uh, detector now. Actually, on the left side, you see a test pattern that has a period uh, of uh, 500 uh, nanometers. No, uh, yes, from, uh, of, sorry, no, 532 divided by 2 uh, nanometers. So we can resolve about 200 nanometers. We can um, Study atom ion dynamics with this in real space, and we have seen that new molecular uh, ion. And of course, with this detector, you can now study many other things, you know, uh, polar polarons, you can look at Fermi gases, um, measure directly with the resolution of 200 nanometers, any correlation function yeah, that you might be interested in, in your many body system in three dimensions. That's the important thing. 
Uh, the file you don't need a copy the message or anything for that. Okay, that concludes it for today, and thank you for your attention. Oh, the team, of course, here. Um, that is the eye microscope uh, team with uh, uh, Moritz uh, Zuber, who is the first author of the paper that is going to come out. Uh, Christian Veit is a, a PhD student who set up the eye microscope together with Nico and another student, Thomas Schmid, who graduated already. And we have uh, uh, Jan, uh, who is a postdoc with us, Gloria, and Robert are the staff members of this team. And Virat, of course, is a PhD student up there, uh, also contributed to it. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, the, um, the rate is the same, but if the atoms move fast or the ions move fast and they are hot, yes, they, they will leave the, uh, the PEC uh, also very fast. Right? So it's the time scale of the scattering that is constant. Yeah? So the time between the scattering events. But if you have a fast moving thermal ion in the first place, then it will be gone very quickly. The, the initial condition should be very cold. Yeah. And the, the dominant force you want to have, the dominant part of that motion should be induced by that very small electric field. If your initial thermal motion is larger than the velocities that we have talked about here, then you cannot observe. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we should go back and remind you that the velocities we are talking about are less than one meter. So they, they are on the order of one meter per second. Yeah. Iron curves has to be cold. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the side plane cooling is always with respect to a uh, uh, Trap center that is undergoing micro motion. Right? So, relative to the trap center, it can be extremely cold. Right? In the, but, I mean, now in your reference frame is given by the PC, which is uh, uh, sitting in, in that frame, not in the rotating frame of the trap. Right? So, uh, I actually have a plot uh, of the here of the various systems. I, I jumped over this. Um, where the different systems currently are in terms of their collisional energy between ground state atoms and ions. Right? And you see, they are due to micro motion, they are typically limited on the millitelli level. Right? And our experiment here, I mean, goes all the way down to the micro. Uh, one should say that actually, there's if you have a light atom, yes, like lithium, for example, here. Um, then this can be uh, much improved. And this group of René Gerritzmar, for example, has mastered that system and brought it down to the tens of microcredit level as well by using buffer gas cooling and also very finely uh, reducing the micro mode. I mean, if you have a power trap and you really put it to the electric fields center, yes, I mean, you really zero out all the electric fields, the static electric fields that we have from outside. Then it's possible to trap the ion really at the very uh, minimum without micro motion, but that's only one space at one point in space. And the typical experiments don't have the well enough static electric field control to uh, minimize the deviation from that, and therefore the micro motion. Sure. 
Yes, so if you just have the ion, it's just a rubidium plus ion, yes. So Yeah, yeah, that's possible. Yes, there is a rubidium two plus ion, but the bond length of this is an answer or two answers. So this is not um, it's not what we are exciting. We are exciting uh, deliberately only those with the uh, rubidium two plus molecule. But your detection scheme is, I guess, in the beginning you were saying you need to have one ion, but at the end like it was multiple ions. How do you? No, no, there was always one ion, always. Everything that I took. Well, okay, so, so here we are converting one Wittberg atom into an ion by still ionizing the Wittberg atom, and then we have two ions. But we need to separate them far enough such that charge, the, the repulsion basically between them is not the distracting our, uh, um, our spatial information. It's a very good point. Yeah. So there was like this one picture where you thought the red dot and thought the blue dot. Uh, What's the red dot? Uh, like kind of the, the red dot, like the initial ion. Ah, yes, ion. yes, yes, yes. So then yeah. multiple run. Of course, yes. I mean, all of this is uh, <laughs> in a single run. So I should say the following yes, we prepare the code cloud. And then we typically run up to 6,000 experiments in one cloud. I mean, one experimental run takes 100 microseconds or less. Yes. So we can repeat one and the same experiment in one cloud many, many times yeah? and average the signal this way. Yeah? So this kind of data set is still uh, it takes half an hour or so to take this. Yeah? Not every shot produces an ion. Yeah? So most of the time, actually, nothing happens. So I told you that we are only accepting this, these events. Yeah? We are only accepting uh, data that has produced two events on our MCP, and uh, that's actually less than one percent of the time that, that this happens. Yeah, that's a very good question. I jumped over this. Of time. Uh, okay, let's think about this. Yes. If we have, uh, if you want to get to the quantum regime of the atom ion collision, yes, then we have the, we go to the S wave regime. Yes. Then we have this a similar uh, configuration. You want to know what is the typical length scale, yes. Um, of the um, of the uh, interaction, yeah? and you have to um, think. H bar squared over two m r star squared. That's sort of the typical. Uh, kinetic energy, yes? and you have to solve this for our star that gives you the um, typical length scale. Uh, and that is, of course, because that is a very strong interaction as compared to the normal van der Waals interaction. This will be thousands of atomic units, yes? very large, which in turn means if you want to reach this quantum regime, your relative. Collision and energy has to be very, very small. Yes, and that's what I actually showed you in uh, that one graph where I jumped over at the beginning. Um, there you saw the state of state of art of these hybrid systems, this one here. Yeah. So you see these are all the ion trap experiments, all the references. You can find the references in this paper, by the way. Um, and their distance to the quantum limit. Yes. So this is a logarithmic state. So um, almost all experiments are very far away from that quantum limit, except that one experiment here now by uh, Gerritsma, who has really reached 
that limit because he is using a uh, um, lithium and lithium produces uh, a, a small m here. Yes, that's, that's, that's this calculation. This one there here, and then the two m four divided by h bar square root of it, right? Right. Yes. And then you see if you have a light atom here, then um, your distance becomes smaller and the corresponding, so if you want to have the Pauli wavelengths be on that order. Yes. So this is the conditional OS wave. Yes. Um, so that means if you calculate it for lithium, then this order is at nine microkelvin. Yes. Whereas for rubidium, yeah, it's about 50 nanocalories or so. So even a single recoil, you know, when you produce the iron by photo uh, by absorption process, or so makes this iron hotter than this uh, temperature that is required to enter the quantum machine. So that's why lithium is an extremely good choice if you want to enter the quantum chemistry limit of. Uh, of atom ion proliferation. To be sure that M is the reduced mass, but it's a very, mass. very mass imbalanced system. But it's dominated by the majority of the flavors to the black it, it is totally dominated by the also be a heavy ion. Well, it could be a light ion as well, but I mean, the, the, the reduced mass, the reduced mass is M1, M2, divided by M1 plus M2. So if there's if M1 is the light one, just get rid of it here, and it's just the light one itself. As long as that one is large, as long as the M2 is large. Yeah. If it is light, then there's a factor of two. Yeah. It's the same way when it's a factor of two. Yeah. So that's the quantum vision. Yeah. I want to go back to your question. I mean, you said that this um, dipole molecule with an intentional bond. I would have said that that's a Vanderbilt molecule where maybe the more oppenheimer approximation doesn't hold with the electronic vibration of the sample, but I still would have said it's a Vanderbilt. Well, I mean, the Thunderbolts would mean that, I mean, you have a crossing of a loose dipole and the permanent dipole here. Yeah, yeah but I mean, the, the Okay, so we have a lot of discussions also with Peter. What actually does it mean to break the bond of my approximation? Um, as long as this vibrational frequency here is smaller than the gap that we have, which is 100. Uh, Megahertz compared to 10 megahertz, we believe this adiabatic picture is still valid. Uh, I mean, non adiabatic stuff would happen. Well, let me see. If, for example, if you oscillate around here, you will make a transition to the next uh, asymptote, or to, uh, sorry, to the next uh, potential curve. Yeah. So if it is a, I think, I mean, it is fully adiabatic. Otherwise, you wouldn't see these vibrational uh, spectra. Yeah. Is it just so we can drive that the molecule is massive and it's just the central function of the I mean, the best iron that induces a dipole moment. Yeah. So the thunderbolts for me is always there are. Fluctuating dipoles on one side, and I'm using the dipole on the other side. So already that is not so not consistent with the okay. Molecule. So I guess I feel like it's a multipolar molecule long range. Molecule. It is a multipolar, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the dominant part is a dipole moment, yeah. But it's flipping as you're going across, and you are still following this curve adiabatically here. Yeah, that's the interesting part. Yes, and you have thought. Initially, if you look at this from the distance, here, yeah, it looks like 
crossing, right? Non avoided crossing. Like you would just, you would just uh, be attracted and move in here, yes? But the interesting thing is that this distance here yeah. is larger than the vibrational space. Yeah. That allows us to, to resolve it. Everything is electronic. Yeah. Well, except that, except that I think like the subtle way is a little bit different. The way you break down the interaction, right? It's the electron is the house and it's a dispersion. And then I fully agree. I mean, there, there this, is, this is very different. You're scattering, you know, scattering yeah. kind of the electron. Yeah, that's very different. Mm -hmm. And you take this the frame of the flipping, how would you then describe like which were the Maxidine way also? Like you would then go first at the Boston where the this internal state of the now that's related, let's that's say. Right? Yeah. That's related. But they are basically both partners are changing. Yes, yeah. right. Here the ion should stay the ion. Right? But the multiple expansion is the same. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, the, sorry, the, 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 the Kepler frequency is, is still very much here, yes? So, I mean, the, the Kepler frequency is basically the splitting between 51 and 52 here, yes? So that's the time scale of the electron orbital. And that is, you know, 20 gigahertz or something like this. That's even larger frequency. Yeah. And, and this is 11 megahertz here, yes, so that's a small time scale. And the next level, electronic level that you might be interested in is the side down here, yes, from the next star state. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You are on here, I can see it. So, yeah, right. So if he logs out, out, I'll be like the request is like if I log off, see what happens. Bt verlassen. And I have to make you the co-host. Right, yeah, you just see.